Uh, again, it, it is indeed a great blessing to, to, to be able to bring you all such powerful national voices um, to come and preach here at The Way. And um, this, this uh, wonderful, wonderful dear sister and friend is no stranger to many of us here at The Way. Uh, many of us that participate in national uh, conferences like the Christian Community Development Association, CCDA. How many CCDA folks we got in here know what that is? In a varsity, how many university folks know what that is? So uh, she is a, a wonderful, wonderful gift and blessing. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to have her. Uh, her name is Erna Kim Hackett, amen. And she is coming to uh, preach and deliver the word of God for us today. She serves currently right now as the associate director for the uh, National Urban Programs for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. She is also uh, has served as uh, some of the, the um, MCs and, and program uh, coordinators for Urbana conferences and the CCDA conferences. She's uh, served for, I think, almost 20 years or so uh, as uh, the director or one of the staff members for Black Campus Ministries in various different campuses across the state, mostly in Los Angeles. And so I'm so glad to have her hanging out with us today. And uh, she got a chance to hang out with some of our leaders yesterday and just a great, great dear sister. So I'm excited to introduce to you all uh, this wonderful vessel of the Lord. So come on, stand back to your feet and let's put our hands together. Let's welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Erna Kim Hack. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, The Way. I'm one of those people who uh, is like extended community to The Way. I get on that Facebook live stream after I go to church in my own hometown and watch and post a lot of little like comments like, thanks, Pastor Tanisha, that was a word. <laughs> so I'm really glad to be with you in person. Thank you so much. So I feel like, I mean, I'm not a, the least bit intimidated to come up after that panel and definitely not after Tiffany, <laughs> who's a genius. So um, thanks for that setup. I'm, see, I'm just leaning on the Lord for confidence. Yes. So this morning I'm going to be speaking out of the Gospel of Luke. And one of the things I love about the book of Luke is that it often shows people in the same situation responding differently. So Luke 15 is the story of two sons, one who stays home and one who runs away. And Luke 10 is the story of two sisters. When Jesus comes to visit their house, one stays in the kitchen, one goes in the living room and sits at his feet. There's a story of two rich men. One turns away from Jesus. The other, Zacchaeus, gives away half of all he owns. There's two men who go to the temple and pray, but only one walks away justified. And there are two men dying on the cross, one on either side of Jesus, and one mocks Jesus, and one asks for forgiveness. And so what we see in that motif is that there is always an option for how you will respond to a certain situation. And so I want to take a look at the very first snapshot that we get in the book of Luke, which is two people get visited by an angel, two people find out they're going to have an unexpected pregnancy, and we have two different responses to that situation. Amen? So we are going to look at Zechariah. Now we have to, I think about scripture like a movie, all right? And so one, we have to think about the last thing the prophet said in Malachi is, I'm going to send a forerunner, all right? I'm going to send somebody. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. These words were spoken, and then 400 years. What if I told you that Black Panther's not coming out next week? It's coming out four weeks from now. That would feel like a long time. What if I said it was going to come out four years from now? What if I said it was going to come out 400 years from now? You'd be like, my babies, 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 babies are going to have to wait to see that movie. That's what it's like, is this 400-year wait for the forerunner. But then finally something happens, and that's where we jump in at Luke. And it opens up on the temple. Now, we have to imagine, like, we're in the desert. This is before electricity, all right? And so there's this old-school Jewish historian, and he described it. And he's like, there was nothing that it lacked. This temple was covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, and the sun would come up, and it would just shine for miles. 
So you can feel the anticipation building like, ah, we're in Jerusalem. We are at the temple. The temple is on a hill. The sun is shining on it, right? So this is where the music kind of comes in in the background just a little bit. You're like, hmm, something's about to happen. Then we meet Zechariah, and Zechariah, you're like, hmm. He's this picture of Jewish holiness, religious devotion. And he, is, um, he quotes one of the most important motifs in Jewish history, which is an elderly couple that wants children but can't have children. Right, so when they say Zechariah is an older man who's faithful, who wants kids but hasn't had them, who does that make them think about? Who does that make them think about? Abraham, right? right, the patriarchs. So then you're like, yes, I'm catching what's going on right now. Then we find out that this is a special day for Zechariah. Now I'm going to give us some numbers, but trust me, they're significant. Back in that time when Zechariah was serving, they say there was about 8,000 priests that were serving, and they were divided into 24 different divisions. Each division had like 300 priests. Zechariah was a part of the Abijah division, and they would serve for two weeks every year. And there was 56 priests that would participate each day. Each day there's two services. Each day these priests come up and they draw lots. All right, which means like draw on a straw to see if you get to do what is basically like the job that every priest hope he gets a chance to do, which is go deeper into the temple to put incense on the altar of incense. Because what will happen is the people of Israel will stand outside and be praying, and then you go inside and you put this incense on the altar, and as the smoke rises up, it's like a symbol of the prayers of the people of God rising up. And the thing is, there were so many priests serving at that time that typically you might only be able to do this once in your life, maybe never in your life. Wow. So when we show up and Zechariah is in the temple and he's drawn the lot and he's going into where the altar of incense is, you can feel like, yes, it's about to be on. <laughs> then he is at the altar and an angel shows up. Get a picture of a little fat white baby out your mind because that's not what shows up at the altar of incense. These angels are powerful. They're terrifying, right? So this angel shows up and says, Zechariah. And you know, the music is swelling and you're like, yes. And he says, your prayer has been heard. You are going to have a son and this son will be a forerunner. The one you've been waiting for for 400 years. Music strings come in. The music is rising. And Zechariah's response is, me and my lady are like real, real old. <laughs> and this is where you feel like, oh, this is going to be rough. Because this angel starts to talk trash. He goes, oh, <clears throat> you must not know my name. <laughs> my name is Gideon. You must not know where I recently came from. The presence of the living God. And because the words coming out of your mouth are a problem, you will shut up for nine months and really think about it. And you just feel like, I waited 400 years for that. That's like the needle on the record, like, like, no, that's very anticlimactic. Then the camera pans back, all right? So now we're coming out of the temple, and now we're coming out of Jerusalem, and now we're heading out past the first suburb. You know, like the first suburb that still has like a good shopping mall. And then we're going to like the next suburb. And then we're going to the next suburb like that you only stop at to get like a little bit of food before you hit the five because there's nothing for a while. And then there's like the next little town and you don't even know if anybody really lives there. And then there's like the next little town and then the next little town and then we hit Nazareth. Right, which is just like a podunk, tiny little, nobody heard of town in the middle of nowhere. And the camera kind of comes down this row, this alley, this, and we go inside the house. A small, small little house. And inside is like a 13, 14 year old girl. This girl is like every other girl of her time. Mary is some uneducated, most likely illiterate, little girl who's gonna get married, have a lot of kids, probably lose some of them in childbirth, not travel very far from the town that she lives in, and live and die in anonymity just like thousands and thousands of other girls like her. And this angel shows up and says, you, oh favored one, get to partner with the living God in one of the most intimate ways you can partner with another being. You will 
have a child with God. Now, she asks a question, but Gideon, because you know he takes, he doesn't hear it as doubt, right? So it's different than Zechariah's question. And then once it's explained to her how she will have a child, she responds with this radical, beautiful moment of, may it be to me according to your word. So open. And what I love about this snapshot is we see how the kingdom of God is going to be. The people you think are going to be at the center. The man with the religious education, with the role in the temple, in Jerusalem, that you think will be the model of faith. Sit down. Be quiet. Sit down. I lean on the word that the Lord will make some people shut up at some point. I seek God on that word in these times. And this little no-name, anonymous girl goes from the margins of the margins of the margins of the margins to the center of the story. And we find out that's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. That is what it's going to be about. Now, what I love is her in this moment of obedience, but I think sometimes we think that when God comes into our life, it's going to be just so wonderful. You know, it's like a little bit Disney, like. (laughs) Like a little bird comes down. No, God's disruption into Mary's life is fantastic, but it's also disruptive, and it puts a lot of suffering into her life her reputation, her potential marriage, and what she sees in her own son's life. So I think we just have to give up the dream. Sometimes we like, God, come in. God, come into my life. God, I want an anointing. God, I want a word. Mary got a word, and it was so good. But also, it didn't mean that all suffering was lifted out of her life. That's hard. But we don't need to be discouraged Because the angel drops this word in there. And he says, also, your really old cousin Elizabeth is also pregnant. And so what he offers her is community. This crazy thing has happened, but don't worry, you're not alone in it. So it says, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste. She was like, I need to get to my girl. To the city of Judah, she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, we have to picture this. Elizabeth is old, all right? Not like, I don't want to give an age for what I think is old. So, Drink a little water and let the moment pass. <laughs> but my father was 60 when he had me. Usually when the brothers hear that, they're like, interesting. <laughs> All right. My father was 60 when he had me. So everyone mistook him for my grandfather, right, every place I went. Elizabeth is like that. You know what's like to see a woman who looks like a grandmother who's pregnant? It's just kind of like, kind of doesn't look classy. Like, it's weird. Right? And I think, too, like some women carry their pregnancies like very tiny. Do you know what I mean? Like you don't even know they're pregnant, and they turn around, and there's like a tiny little <laughs> basketball right here. I don't think that's what's going on. I think Elizabeth is like great with child. <laughs> All right? So you have a very large, I mean, this is like, you know, in my, my prophetic imaginings. All right? You just have this very pregnant, very old, large woman whose husband is benched because he did not respond faithfully to Gabriel. Now, in some church traditions, it's like, ooh, if your husband's struggling, you should just go stand like silently by him because you don't want to hurt his ego. And that is not what is happening here. (laughs) 
Because it says when she sees Mary come in, <laughs> she says with a loud cry. She exclaims. She has things to say. She's taking up space in every way. She's talking loud. Her body is big. She's elderly. She's pregnant. And she is speaking truth all over Mary. She's saying, you're blessed, even though this whole thing is turning your life upside down. And your baby is blessed, even though you're not married. And I'm blessed just to see you. And my son, who is John the Baptist, in the womb is doing his job already. Because he, you walked in and he was like, that's him. <laughs> like, John the Baptist working in utero. And she says, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was. Think about what it's like for Zechariah's wife to say, blessed are you. Because when an angel showed up to you, you believed that it would be fulfilled. <laughs> she does not shrink back. And this is the picture of community at the beginning of Luke. This big old pregnant loud lady and this knocked up teenage unwed girl looking at each other and seeing God's work in each other. That's the kingdom. It's these two women from the margins who see that they have been brought to the center. And then something happens for Mary, right? It's not that she just experienced something from God and she had the courage to respond faithfully. But once Elizabeth can see it in her and name it and affirm it, suddenly she can interpret her own experience more clearly. And she busts out with this theological exclamation which is called the Magnificat. And a lot of people dismiss it as just a little piece of poetry, but it's actually an incredibly profound theological reflection. And it's important to call it theology because so often when we as women, as women of color, as people from the margins, when we take our lived experience, when we exegete our own bodies, when we create theology from it, we're dismissed. Yeah. Oh, that's not theology, that's like, neat thinking for you. Yeah. But Mary is theologizing. She understands that what is happening isn't just some like, unique thing to her. She's like, oh, this is how it's going to be. If me from way over here is brought to the middle, it means a couple of things. It means those who were in the center must move. So she says the rich are brought down. Those who have eaten are sent away, but the hungry, they're fed. Yeah. And the lowly, like me, right? Lowly is her word for the margins. Someone like me off in the margins, we're lifted up. Yeah. And her own son, Jesus, riffs on this framework that it's not just cute charity, like, oh, that's sad that you're like a little literate girl, but we're keeping the system the same. No, she says this whole thing is going to get flipped. And later, when her son shows up, he says, Spirit of the Lord is upon me to be good news to the poor. Flip the system. And later, when he's riffing on the Sermon on the Plain, he says, blessed are the poor and woe to the rich. The full system. So her own son riffs on this theme that she introduces here. This is important. I just, who even knows where my notes are? <laughs> Have I been to my notes today? All right. This has been important for me because I grew up in a context where what white men thought about the world was truth and theology, and what people from the margins thought was like decorative additions. You know, it's kind of like they were the Christmas tree and like, oh, black folks think stuff? That's, that's cute black liberation theology and lady theology and Oh, black women, that's womanist theology. And it was like decorative extras. But what Luke 1 teaches me is it's not decorative extras. It's not the people with the degrees that you think will be the models of the faith. It's not the Zechariahs. They will sit down and be benched for a minute. It's going to be queer black women from the streets of Ferguson. 
It's going to be unaccompanied minors in the Alameda School District. It's gonna be my little five foot tall Korean immigrant aunt who came here speaking no English, worked as a maid during the week where people screwed her over on her wages all the time, ignored her because she couldn't speak English. But on the weekends, planted churches all over Washington State. It's gonna be, it's going to be those folks. We're not decorative, we are the tree. And so I just want to talk about this for a little bit. This, when I was thinking about the way, as I was preparing to come here, this moment of Mary and Elizabeth and what they give each other, and just what does God have for us as we think about that. The first thing I want to say is that I have to name the fact that women are at the center of the story. Because this earth is still a patriarchal mess. I preached at a church a couple weeks ago and somebody went on the Facebook page just to comment on how they didn't like they don't believe in women preachers. Wow. And then I'm like, and yet I am and yet I am here. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't even hurt me because I have Luke and I know how it is. And I know who gets brought to the center and I know who gives us theology. But you know that I never saw an Asian American woman preach until I was over 40. Now I thank God for the legacy of black women preaching the pulpit in the church because if not for that, I may not have seen a woman in the pulpit for all the early years of my life. Black women preachers were my only role models as a preacher. And so I just want to say that what I see here first is all the ways that we are still getting minimized as women, and even the way those marginalizations happen in Christian spaces, that's not from the Lord. That's not from God. And that's not biblical. What we see in Luke is that women from the margins get brought to the center, and this community that we can create with each other is centered. Another thing I see happening here is that Elizabeth is able to do something unique for Mary as an elder. Right? She's older. Even though there is something similar about their experience, it is a little different because Elizabeth, is she's respected. Right, she's married to this priest. Even though she's been um, alienated because she hasn't been able to have a child, there's something she's able to give as an elder. And so I just want to talk about that for a moment. I, one of the most beautiful examples of this that I ever saw, and I, and I say this because I don't believe in this weird trend that's going on that kind of like hates on the younger generation. Like, I don't understand why there's so many articles about like la la the millennials <laughs> and like la la Gen Z. I'm in campus ministry. I love the young people. I love college students. I believe in the next generation. Like, it's on us to find, I mean, this is like what Sharice was saying. It's on us to find the open doors. I don't see anywhere in scripture where it's like, also just walk around and criticize the young. I mean, I just don't see that. So a year, um, a year after Michael Brown Jr. was murdered, I was in Ferguson for an event that was put on by a group of concerned black academics talking about the intersection of uh, black folks in academia and activism. And um, they were much too smart for me, but I sat there and I nodded like a lot. Um, it's similar to the panel this morning. And uh, there was a, they had a panel of young activists, young women, whose commitment to the movement just brought me to tears. I mean, there was a, a woman who had been on the streets marching literally every day for 365 days. I was just humbled by their commitment. And after they had shared, there was an older gentleman that came along, and he said, you know, I was part of the civil rights movement, and I have been waiting for you ever since. And you are the answer to my prayers. And he just blessed them. And that is a unique gift that older folks can give to younger folks. And I think we need to see, say and name, I see God in you. And we just need to give that generously. Let's give it. So I think 
The elders of this church give that generously. I'm in my 40s. I try to give it to my college students, to the younger folks. College students, give it to the youth. Just give that blessing generously. When I was like in seventh or eighth grade, someone in college paying attention to me? I mean, that was so cool and so amazing. And what they said was so, uh, they had my attention. Let's give that elder blessing to one another just generously. Can we do that? A second way is I think that we need to do this as communities, as marginalized communities for each other. So I was sitting out there and I was listening to, a I was waiting for Pastor Mike and I was listening to a couple of the girls who go here and they were talking to each other and they were debating about how like Nicki Minaj feels competitive with other women rappers but Cardi B doesn't. And, um, <laughs> and I'm not here to argue the merits of that <laughs> or not, but what they were, the profound truth that they were getting at is there's not a lot of women rappers and sometimes it's easy when you're on the margins and there's a few of you to feel competitive with each other. And I think sometimes, as marginalized communities, we can feel competitive with each other versus doing what Elizabeth and Mary do for one another, which is, I see what is happening in your community, and it's of God. And so an important, like an example of this for me, so uh, some of you know Dominique, he's a part of your extended community here, and Dominique and I led a seminar um, on building bridges between the Asian American and the African American community. Yeah. And when we're, and it was in Los Angeles, you know, where there's a lot of history, particularly of tension between the Korean American and Korean immigrant community and black folks. And I felt like one of the ways to build bridges, what was important to say is for me as a Korean American who is from Los Angeles, I see what is happening in the black community. I see your resistance to the systematic and institutionalized violence that you are experiencing. I see the resistance that you're putting to that. And that is of God. The theology you've created and exegeted about black lives matter, I see it. I agree with it. I bless it. I stand with you in it in whatever way I can. And we need to, I think our communities need to do that generously with each other. And I think sometimes we struggle with that generosity when we're in our own trauma. But I think we get, I mean, but Elizabeth is in trauma and her husband is off doing journaling, I hope, about his decisions. <laughs> and Mary is in trauma. Her, like, marriage is about, you know, her engagement is about to fall apart, and her reputation is in the garbage. But even in the midst of their trauma, they are able to be this community to each other. And so I want to ask us to be that for each other. And I think we just need to do this as individuals. There are folks in this church. They just need someone to look at them and say, I see you trying to be faithful. Yeah. Yeah. I see a good God thing yeah. in you. Yeah. I see that. And so I just, I want to invite us. Sometimes, I think sometimes being that generous with affirmation, it feels vulnerable, right? Like it's not very cool to be like, hey, I really see God at work in you. <laughs> but I would rather be awkward and give someone an experience of yeah. God. Yeah. All right? I just feel like we let a little bit of social awkwardness shut down so much good stuff. So I just feel like, you know what? Be slightly awkward. You think that person's going to remember the affirming word or the slightly awkward transition into it? They will remember the affirming word. So let's just be those people to each other. Amen? Amen. So that's, uh, that's my reflections off of Luke 1 for us today. And as I was, uh, I want to just take a little time to just pray for folks. I had a couple groups of folks that I was thinking about that um, I wanted to pray for. And then I just, even as we close, as we're worshiping, if there's someone that came to mind who you just want to give them an affirming word, just do it. Grab their wrist, look at them, say something good. I see God at work in you. Come on. One group of people that has literally been on my mind for a month is women of color in academia. Since I was here a month ago, and I, I heard Tiffany actually in a seminar, there was something that God just put, that there is something about women of color in academia, man, that is some white supremacist patriarchal space up in the academy. And that God wanting to say, what, it's not just the what you are working on, like 
the, what you are producing, though that is important, but just what is embodied as you are in that space and who you are, I see that and I bless that and that's important and I want you to feel renewed and I wanna pour into you because I know the system that you're in and the exhaustion of what you are trying to resist and I see you. And so I just feel like if you are a woman, if you're in college, if you're getting your graduate degree, can you stand up, can we pray for you? Can we pray for these women? Stand up, I wanna pray for you, stand up. The Lord has had you on my mind. He knows that there are many times in the classroom or in that context, small things that minimize you, little assumptions, or giant, absolutely huge assumptions about what is good and what is true that dehumanize. And God, you've been on his mind. And in the way that he sees Mary and partners with her and brings her to the center, God sees you and partners with you. Not just the work you're producing, but with your very body. Blesses you and sees you. Jesus, would you be renewing these women in any areas of fatigue? Would you be strengthening them? Lord, would you be binding up the power of lies, spoken and unspoken? And in the ways that they feel their marginalization, we know, God, that you bring them to the center. You center them. Would you be just refreshing them, strengthening them, giving them community in each other and mentors, God, and resources and supernatural provision financially, God. And we welcome their voices. We welcome their voices. Lord, in some of these spaces where they say they want diversity, but then they, we actually try to bring our voice and perspective, and it's shut down. You welcome our full voices, God. So just bless these women. Bless these women. In the name of Jesus, we're grateful for each of them in this room. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The other group of folks I wanted to pray for is folks who are kind of in the position of Mary, where God's been coming in, maybe trying to get into your life, inviting you towards something, but you see the disruption, right? You see that it's going to maybe mess up a plan. You could say, like, Mary's got a plan. She's going to marry Joseph, right? She's not like, I'm going to marry Joseph unless God decides to have a baby with me. That is like plan A and Joseph is plan B. No, this whole thing that God does is a disruption but it's a God thing. And so I think there are some of you where you can tell God's been pressing you towards something, but you've been resisting. And so I just want to, as we're singing this song, this song's been on my mind for the last day or two, is just a way to respond to God with more of a yes. With more of a yes. So you can feel free to stand and sing along. You can pray. But I think for all of us to close with this posture of Mary saying, I can say yes to you. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting to be where you are across the hottest desert I travel near or far for your glory I will do anything just to see you to behold you Behold you as my king for your glory. For your glory, I will do anything just to see you. To behold you as my king. 
Lord, if I find favor. Lord, if I find favor in your sight. Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting. So be with me. another and we name that and we call that out and it transforms us God let us live into the reality that you take all the unseen people the most marginalized and bring them to the center and elevate them God thank you Jesus thank you God we worship you it is easy to worship the goodness of who you are when I see this God it is easy to worship the goodness of who you are. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For your glory, I will do anything just to see. Behold you as my King. Thank you, God. 